we have heard and read about how Bali Maharaj is, uh, was the king of the entire universe. And then Vamandev has uh, somehow plotted against him. And then uh, in a very tricky and cheating, but a very beautiful uh, reciprocation between the Lord and his devotee, uh, we are now at this stage where two steps have been taken. Adipushpa is difficult to hear. Oh, I, one minute, I think I'll put this on also. Is it better now? Okay, okay. okay. So, uh, so he's taken the first step, the second step, and then now there is no place for the third step. So Bali Maharaj has been bound by Varuna and his associates have been defeated. He's sent to the hellish planets. But of course he was sent to Sutala Loka, which is more beautiful than the uh, upper uh, heavenly planets. And now let's, I was just going to go through the uh, purport and then keep discussing as we go along. So Prabhupada starts. Bali Maharaj could understand the pretense of Lord Vamandev who had taken the side of the demigods and come before him as a beggar. First of all, it's so interesting that the Bhagavatam and the deep bhakti literatures have a description of these characters who are who externally are so not a devotee, especially Bali Maharaj and Vritrasur, who are absolutely no way externally a devotee, and yet internally they were perhaps the greatest. Bali Maharaj is the uh, example the epitome of when we speak of the nine processes of devotional service, Atmani Vedanam, the example is Bali Maharaj. And Vritrasur's prayers are considered one of the highest prayers in line of the prayers of the gopis when he's finally giving up his body. And I was just wondering how interesting it is that they were devotees and yet they were placed in an external dharma. It was their dharma to be a demon. When Ritrasur is speaking to Indra, he's just, he's, it is so amazing to see, you know, why could he just not have given up his demoniacness and just become a little uh, Brajavasi and gone to Vrindavan? But he was as, as externally enthusiastic about his dharma as a demon. I am going to fight you. And, and the way he's fighting, he's killing and mercilessly slaughtering the demigods run away in fear and the demons run away later because the demigods attack with further strength and then he he's fighting so fiercely with indra and indra's thunderbolt falls and yet he says pick up your thunderbolt because that's meant to kill me and it's so amazing to see the simultaneous uh, on one side the perfect role of a demon and he's speaking like a devotee and so also with bali maharaj who is uh, initially, if we go back, he's conquered the heavenly planets. He did all these amazing rituals and pujas. And now he's got the power by Shukracharya, he's conquered all the planetary systems. And here he is as a big demon giving charity. And yet, at the same time, his internal heart is absolute pure devotional service. And my source of happiness is Krishna. So that's quite uh, beautiful to see here how how in these great souls, of course, that at one level, perhaps there are lessons to be learned that we all have, um, we have a conditional dharma and we have a constitutional dharma. We have two dharmas which we all play in this world. Our conditional dharma is the dharma brought to us by our psychophysical nature, which we find ourselves in our circumstance, our inclinations, our tendencies, by our many lives in this material realm. And now in this body, I have to play out a certain dharma, express certain desires, address certain things, fulfill certain desires, not full, et cetera, all this. And I have to play out that dharma, which was the Varnashram dharma, Brahmana, Kshatriya, Vaishya, Shudra, how do you, all that. 
and at the same time we have our absolute internal eternal dharma which is the soul's journey back to godhead and sometimes these two dharmas um, play out very well together and sometimes they are perhaps contradictory like in the lives of these bali maharaj and rutras whose external dharma and and therefore even in even in the chaitanya charitamrita sometimes when mukunda uh, not mukunda gadadhar pandit is bewildered seeing pundarik vidyanidhi who is who comes into navadvip on a palanquin and here he is sitting in his palatial house being fanned by his uh, by his girlfriends uh, who are serving him and he's eating uh, grapes like i don't know the scene from cleopatra or something and then and here mukunda brings him to meet this great vaishnava and he's wondering who is who is who is this person and then when mukunda sings aho uh, bakiyam stana kala kutam he's singing about how krishna delivered putana and then pundarik vidyani is going mad ripping his clothes out ah screaming in ecstasy then gadadhar understands oh my god that was his external dharma and this is his heart and yet he has to play it out yet pundrik vidyanidhi had to do what he had to do and so it's it's quite interesting in our life also we have to accommodate and and play out both the dharmas uh, and we have to do both of them well krishna in uh, the gita also tells arjuna that i have to also follow my dharma although nothing in this world binds me although i am the creator yet to set an example i am following my dharma and so and sometimes there is this wonderful play and a continuous balance and adjustment knowing that ultimately the internal dharma is what has to ultimately prevail and the external dharma supports that if the external dharma is uh like the varnashram forms a platform without that it may be difficult to practice pure devotional service at the same time uh, the the purpose of everything is that the soul can peacefully practice pure devotional service so bali maharaj setting us giving us this uh, amazing example of playing the role of a great demon king and yet the heart of really the epitome of atmanivedanam i was it's at least for me it's a little even difficult to comprehend it it sounds easy actually okay he gave the third step he's to really put ourselves in that condition okay and then prabhupad continues although the lord's purpose was to cheat him bali maharaj took pleasure in understanding how the lord will cheat his devotee to glorify the devotee's position it is said that god is good and this is a fact whether he cheats or rewards he is always good and this is another beautiful theme from the purport where prabhupad is talking about uh, prabhupad once described this as he said whether a father slaps his son or gives him a hug whether the father chastises his son or appreciates him with sweet words the it's absolutely the same it's absolutely equal it's absolutely for the sun's progress and happiness and pleasure and long term uh, good standing and similarly in our life we will sometimes see krishna giving us a tough time a hard time and sometimes a very easy sometimes a very smooth journey and so Uh, and remembering krishna's promise in the bhagavad gita ananya chintayantu mam yajana paripashate tesham nityavrutta yoga kshemam vaham yaham i will carry what you i preserve what you have and i carry what you lack that is a promise and so uh, so we, we have to take heart and be sure that yes however krishna is reciprocating with me and krishna is doing it personally it's not that um it's not through his agency even for a devotee it's not that um you know oh krishna has krishna is imagine krishna up there in goloka and us unlimited number of living beings 
all seeking his attention and praying and desire and this and that and how does krishna manage it perhaps you know he's got so many shaktis so many agencies through which everything happens and he's just peaceful and this was the very doubt that arjuna acharya had and arjuna acharya while a great uh, person in our uh, tradition 5 600 years ago who then scratches off this word while he was commenting on the bhagavad gita he said it can't be aham ananya chintayam tamam yu tesham nitya bhukta nam yoga kshem pam vaham yaham this last word it can't be aham it can't be me krishna can't say me krishna can say he has to say something else i think this word is wrong how can krishna himself be involved with so many devotees and so he scratches that word and then arjuna acharya comes out of his cottage and he's confused what word should i put he comes out and tells his wife i'm going to take a bath come back in some time and just need some fresh air he goes out for his bath wife is making lunch and in this time in the meantime two sweet beautiful looking dark complexion and white complexion boy come and all of you great vaishnavas can guess who they were and then they have a nice dialogue and the wife cannot understand who they are and then after some time the wife of she, she doesn't want them to go and they have brought them fruits and then the wife says please please let me serve you in some way what can i do for you can i feed you they said no 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 then finally the dark complexion boy says you know do you have some medicine she says medicine for what actually someone whipped me on the back and she shocked someone whipped a beautiful she, she couldn't she said wait yeah i'll do something she makes a nice paste and balm and she applies it on his back and then his back is cured and then the boys go away and within a few minutes arjuna acharya comes back and he's like i still can't get the word and i was i'm stuck at this and he eats his lunch and then his wife she is wondering what's happened to his wife she looks like she's staring into space he's like what happened and then she explains the whole incident and then arjuna acharya runs into his room opens the gita and that scratch mark is gone and he understands that i scratched out this word and i i it was like i whipped krishna not believing when he says aham so therefore in our life too krishna is definitely there definitely present definitely reciprocating guiding and um, chaitanya charan prabhu says don't limit the unlimited if we limit if we limit krishna by saying how will krishna be involved in my life he is too far too busy too happy <laughs> to be involved in my life but no he is because he is unlimited he can he can do everything together okay and then prabhupad says bali maharaj addressed him as mm-hmm. sorry i have one more point here oh, okay I'll, yeah um bali maharaj therefore addressed him as uttama shloka your lordship he said you are always praised with the best of selected verses yeah and read that a little further so this word uttama shloka is very beautiful and prabhupad once in 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 the 10th canto purport he describes it as one who is famous as the best of those who are good <laughs> one who is famous as the best of those who are good that is uttama shloka and another meaning of uttama shloka is uttama shloka refers to two things is select verses by select personalities both are equally important it's not that these select in one proper is writing in one place he says and these verses are not just by any rascal <laughs> they are by brahma shukadev shiva so both it's not that just somebody has composed these great glorifications of krishna a great personality has given great glorifications and in this connection it's so important because actually this is how our life is led we all have standards of reference and we all give value and we all have certain people personalities who influence our thoughts and where we want to go and what we want to be and how we want to be and how we want to behave and these personalities um uh, 
our role models, our inspirations, both spiritual and material, whatever they say is going to shape knowingly or unknowingly, because every soul is searching for what, where is my value? Where is value? Where is happiness? What is my happiness? And he's depending on the opinion and the recommendation and the reference given by those he thinks are, yes, this is my standard and whatever this person says. And, and that is why in the Vedic times, uh, the role models were so important. That's why the children were only taught Mahabharat and Ramayana and the Vedic and Srimad Bhagavatam. They were, and they were so careful in who this child and who this as, as a community and as a society, who is praised and who is glorified and who is given that position of being, this is our standard of reference. And this is, and so I was just thinking in uh, our own lives, we have to see who are we giving that power to to become that standard of reference. Um, especially today with so much influence of social media and, and everyone has become a standard of reference and their glory is the number of people who follow them or how much wealth they have made or how much fame do they possess. And with that, they, and with that, that subtly makes uh, then their standard of reference because deep within we also want wealth and fame and this and that and therefore that's that's the standard what does this person say becomes my standard and therefore we have to be so careful of who we are allowing in our life to set those standards and therefore when we hear the whole culture of the bhagavatam was to allow the individual to mingle with these personalities although they are not present in front of our eyes anymore. Although Bali Maharaj and uh, Shukdev Goswami don't have a Instagram profile, but if we mingle with them, just like we do with all these other personalities, then we will, and how do we mingle with them? By reading about their lives. That's why there was so much description and what they are, what they did and how they are, and to form an affectionate bond towards these people. And then, then that affection creates a great interest a, a great uh, and then it, that person becomes a standard of reference and one great example is Srila Prabhupada who for our generation and so many generations is absolutely not physically present to our eyes but because his disciples created a wonderful culture in which we mingled there are n number of countless books about Prabhupada he's there in every temple we took Guru Puja for him so now he kind of has become a standard of reference for devotees. We feel proud about Prabhupada's achievements all over the world. We feel happy to hear Prabhupada's leelas. We, we tell each other, well, Prabhupada says, and, and oh, well, that's what Prabhupada says. So the more we allow ourselves, and, and I was just thinking, if we notice, you know, it really, it feels so good to have standards of reference in Satvagun and all these personalities. They really fill the heart with such good feelings and they immediately bring out the best of our character, the best of our thoughts, the best of our possible qualities and ideals and inspirations in every way. Just thinking about these personalities, being influenced by them, being wanting to be like them, wanting to follow their footst footsteps and words. And, and it was such a, such a, such a nice thing and therefore uttama shloka and therefore select that person who's who's glorified in select verses by select individuals and let's make those individuals also our standards of whom we want to follow and whose words we want and whose example we want to be influenced by and affect our lives and then Prabhupada says and then Vali Maharaj continues in the purport you are always praised with the best of verses on behalf of demigods. You disguised yourself to cheat me, saying that you wanted only three paces of land. But later you expanded your body to such an extent that with two footsteps you covered the entire universe. Because you were working on behalf of your devotee, you do not regard this as cheating. Never mind. I cannot, con I cannot be considered a, dev a devotee. Nonetheless, because although you are the husband of the goddess of fortune, you have come to me to beg. I must satisfy you to the best of my ability. 
So please do not think that I wanted to cheat you. I will, I must fulfill my promise. I still have my body. When I place my body for your satisfaction, please put your third step on my head. So in the purport, Prabhupada is writing this that Bali Maharaj spoke thus. And so I was thinking one more thing that Krishna, Krishna is cheating. Does Krishna really need to cheat? Abs what, what would it take for Krishna? Hiranyakashipu was attacking Prahlad in all kinds of ways. Did, did Prahlad, did Narsimadev really have to undergo all that to think of, okay, what's the loophole in this guy's benediction? And oh, half man, half, okay. And come and then fight with him for two hours and kill him and show this Ugaru group and all that. He could have just given him a heart attack and or did Krishna really have to cheat, kind of cheat and you know do all that? And the Bhagavatam describes that when Narsimadev appeared, he the description is Narsimadev didn't really appear to kill Hiranakashipu, but uh, satyam vidhatum nijabhritya bhashitum to because the word of his devotee that Prahlad said, I'm in this pillar, I got to show up. I have no choice now what to do. And so in the same lines, if we consider Krishna in uh, Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says, Janma karma chame devyam evam yuvati tattvata tattva deham punajama naiti mamiti suarjuna that I am appearing to, sh to attract the world. So the first two shlokas before this, Paritranaya Sadhana Yada Yadahi Dharmasya, in those two shlokas are not considered Krishna's real purpose of descent because he has to annihilate the miscreants to reestablish principles of religion, etc. But any agency can do that. Anybody can do that. Any Krishna can have millions of ways of doing that. So that's the external reason. But the real reason is to attract our hearts. And how will Krishna attract our hearts? Ultimately by showing us, if you become my devotee, this is how I'll reciprocate with you. If you fall in love with me, and this is what you will get. And this is how, and ultimately that, right? Uh, in one lecture, Maharaj said very beautifully that the all of us uh, have a certain free will and it is going to go in a certain direction. But Krishna is so desperate that he wants to change that free will by sh sh coming personally and doing all his pastimes to say, you're using your free will there, here, use it for me. And just change, just, just see, just see what my pastime is, just see how I am, just, just see how my devotees are. And so Krishna has to cheat. And I was just thinking that in, uh, in Arjuna's life, Krishna was his best friend, his dear. Krishna did, it, it is such a, in, in the Bhagavatam when Krishna, uh, Pandavas retired timely to read the verses backward, how Arjuna is recounting what all Krishna did for him. And what an amazing thing. And even on the battlefield of Kurukshetra, Krishna royally cheated, actually. It was impossible for Arjuna to kill Karna. And Krishna cheated so much, arranging for Indra to come and take away his, uh, his natural armor, arranging for when he picked up the Shakti weapon, Krishna pushed the chariot down <laughs> and the Shakti weapon hit his uh, Arjuna's crown. And finally, Krishna made sure that the through the arrange, past arrangements of the curse and this and that, Finally, Karna's chariot sinks and Krishna tells, kill him, cut his head off. And then, and in the case of Jayadra, impossible that Arjuna would have killed Jayadra. And Krishna had to send a Sudarshan, cover the sun, say, cut his head off. I, you know, and didn't say I covered the sun and then just removed his chakra and said, well, everybody, it's still daytime. It was a fair kill. And so many times in so many ways, and Krishna doesn't need to, but just because as he's written here, as Bali Maharaj is saying that, He's saying, because you are working on behalf of your devotee, that's the reason. Because Krishna wants to, Krishna comes into our world and within our, he's above morality and ethics and laws, but still he, because he's taken manushin tanum ashrita, he's taken a human form. So he, he allows, all right, I'll act like a human being. Sometimes he doesn't, but he tries his best, I guess, to, and, and, really reciprocate with us in that loving way. And so Krishna is saying, and so Bali Maharaj is appreciating his cheating and appreciating his, the way he is uh, dealing with Bali Maharaj too. And, and then Bali Maharaj in his humility is, is of course saying, I cannot be considered a devotee nonetheless, 
because although you're the husband of the goddess of fortune so krishna doesn't want anything and then now uh, prabhupada is going to say something very beautiful he says so after this dialogue i'm reading the last part since the lord had covered the entire universe with two steps one might ask how bali maharaj's head could be sufficient for his third step right the entire universe now one person's head but bali maharaj however thought that the possessor of wealth must be greater than the possession therefore although the lord had taken all his possessions the head of bali maharaj the possessor would provide adequate place for the lord's third step and then finally uh, this is a, the possessor is greater than the possession and especially in a situation of love from krishna's point of view definitely what that's why bali maharaj said you are the god husband of the goddess of fortune sarcastically telling him you don't need all this what you really wanted is me and i'm more than happy to finally this is what my like vritrasur finally indra kill me and let me go back home back to god and bali maharaj is saying finally this role which i am playing as a demon is over yes take take everything everything is anyway yours thank you for reciprocating with me and doing this beautiful pastime and cheating me bali maharaj is actually at one yes. level taking great pleasure in being cheated by the supreme personality of god and what a reciprocation just like bhishma was so thrilled when he when krishna had to break his promise so that bhishma could keep his promise and and these reciprocations between krishna and the devotee are so beautiful and then and then when krishna actually becomes subordinate to his devotee bali maharaj and then uh, so and one more thing i wanted to say is 10 minutes okay just 5 minutes more now imagine this scene i'm going to take the name of um Okay, really, there is one hypocritical shloka in the Bhagavatam, very hypocritical by a hypocritical personality. And I want you to imagine this being said by Elon Musk. Okay, Elon Musk, for those of you who know or not know, is currently now the second richest man in the world, estimated at one hundred and sixty-seven billion dollars. To me, it doesn't even make sense. I, I, I have not even seen six figures in my life. What to speak of? how much is that i don't know even 12th i don't know how how many digits is that and what that wealth really means and imagine if he is giving the bhagavatam class and he is speaking like this and he's saying my dear devotees you know uh god can only be approached by someone who's materially exhausted and if you're trying to improve yourself with wealth and education and good parentage can't do it with sincere feeling and what will be our first thought at least my first thought will be yeah right yeah yeah right 167 billion dollars second richest man in the world who is most famous right now and he yeah very easy for you to speak that well i just wanted to put that in perspective because that's exactly how kunti maharani spoke and she is speaking this shloka she says janmeshwarya shruta shribhi my lord your lordship can easily be approached but only by those who are materially exhausted one who's on the path of material progress trying to improve himself with respectable parentage great opulence high education bodily beauty cannot approach you with sincere feeling and it's quite interesting who is it's kunti who is speaking I, i didn't want to use the example of the queen of um, britain because i thought that was a poor comparison sorry kunti was was what a was the queen of the the mother of the king of the entire world at that time her sons were so powerful they had they had they had just defeated they had exterminated races of all other powerful men and now they were the sole emperors of the earth we can't even imagine what wealth what power what fame what beauty her sons she her husbands in one sense were indra dharmaraj ashwini 
twins surya dev they had given her children what a personality and at this point speaking the shloka she is still in that position and yet she speaks that shloka and the way she could speak the shloka is because she is talking about when she spoke, uses the word materially exhausted it need not be externally but it's an internal situation and she is talking about the difference between a person who is the possessor of wealth versus someone who's possessed by all that and by saying material exhausted and in line with what bali maharaj said that the possessor is what krishna wants but if we are possessed then we'll never be able to give ourselves to krishna if we are possessed that means if we place our source of happiness in our abilities in our this is how this is my fame my this my that that's we are possessed because we have given our value and our sense of happiness and our sense of being and and this is who i am this makes me and this is my source of happiness this is my source of joy and everything and maybe also krishna maybe that's that's one great step that krishna is saying you can have all that and be just be not possessed by it akinchan be materially exhausted means no longer maybe i have to continue doing and pursuing these things but at least at least maybe at least i know i should go in that direction at least i i know that yes that's where i have to go so that's how kunti is able to say this because she was absolutely materially exhausted she didn't have any interest or any didn't place any real value she just played out her role played out her uh, the place she was in and so bali maharaj is saying the possessor is greater than the possession and definitely from krishna's point of view ultimately he wants us thank you i just also wanted to mention today is the disappearance of uh udharan dhat thakur and mahesha pandita both were cowherd boys in the spiritual world and they came to do chaitanya leela just wanted to mention so we can great personalities great standards of reference for our lives and just to thank you are there any comments or questions or anything someone would like to add or subtract me thank you karna 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 prabhu <clears throat> all the devotees if you like to unmute yourself for questions or appreciation please feel free to do so you can unmute yourself now <coughs> wonderful class thank you prabhu your spiritual master is empowering you in a beautiful way well, i was very moved to hear that point you were talking about <clears throat> that uh allowing yourself to be influenced by someone you know if someone whose opinion you value someone you're allowed to speak into your life mm. and i was just reflecting last night on the different people who by krishna's arrangement i mean krishna gives us guru to a problem that is certainly prime influence on in my life and shiva prabha indicated one of his servants and asked me please me by serving this person and at different times that person said now go take shelter of narada muni now go shelter of sundakar and now work with you know i've always had a, 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 my god brothers my elder god brothers sterling examples of you know great faith and wonderful dedication and devotional service and and affection that they've shown me over the years and i feel so grateful to krishna for that shelter for that personal care for that you know knowing always knowing who am i supposed to be serving not that i just do service but that i'm actually 
have a person who's giving me an assignment, indicating Prabhupada Desh where to go, um, indicating you know, what my prescribed duty is and who I offer that service to and allow them to say, very good, or maybe you should do like this. And it's, a, it's really, really a personal because the tendency in this age is to be impersonal, right? Prabhupada was um, speaking out so strongly against that, that we just basically, like it says, if you have many gurus, you have no guru. If, you, if he's not the master of all, every aspect of your life, then he's not the master at all. It's just some, you know, picture on the wall or name, you know, so um, I, maybe I'm not, I'm talking around the subject a little bit of, of actually having the shelter, the guidance, um, somebody that I'm accountable to. Mm an authority and how personal that is and how the chain of the succession, you know, that Prabhupada, he pleased his spiritual master and that was his success, you know, and how that we have the same um, responsibility. And Prabhupada spoke very strongly, just like some people in the Ridvik philosophy, they say, well, I will take shelter of Prabhupada, you know, I don't need a guru now. I'll just take shelter of Prabhupada. And Prabhupada said, that's impersonal. You can't jump over the present, the person present in your life. You need a, a personal present authority who you feel inspired to, who's worthy of your complete trust and obedience. And he said, if you don't have somebody like that who'll take you by the ear and say, hey, what are you doing? <laughs> hmm. Somebody to chastise you, somebody to forgive you, somebody to instruct you, somebody to who you are trying to please, then it be, your spiritual life becomes like drifting around. We come, it's so easy to become lost like that, a, a, a lost in the, in the in service, but not quite really focused on serving a person. Hmm. I heard many years ago in 1974, Radha Swami arguing with this other devotee his name is Nishringa. And the Radha Swami and Nishringa used to take turns giving the Bhagavad Gita class in the evening. And so when I first heard Bhagavad Gita, it was from these two people. Mm. And then one day I went up to the Vrindavan farm and I was coming up the stairs and Radha Swami was upstairs with this other devotee. And he said to him, you fool. <laughs> I never heard anybody say that to somebody like that. You know, Radha Swami, he, he is an intense personality and with this full force of his you know um dramatic you know anger he he told us other you fool and he was indicating to the other devotee because the devotee was he was planning to leave Nirvindavan and uh, he said he went to um uh, Kirtan Ananda who was his authority for the last few years and he said I'm I think I should go preach maybe the story is getting too long uh, and he said, but he didn't say anything. And Rana Swami said to him, he didn't say anything because you didn't ask him a question. <laughs> he didn't say, do you think I should go do this? He's your, he's your authority, he's your connection to Prabhupada. And yet you didn't say, you fool. And this devotee was really, really, really nice devotee. And I, I had heard Bhagavad Gita from him for months and months. And then he went away. And then years later, I saw him in California. And we were out there doing some business for New Vrindavan and I, we were around the Los Angeles temple. And I saw him, I said, you shrink, you shrink, Haribo, Haribo. You know, how are you, how are you? Where have you been? He said, well, I, I thought I would go to Hawaii. And then I thought I would go to California. And then I thought I would go to Florida. And then I thought I would go to India. And he was just so wimpy and it didn't have this beautiful effulgence and clear clarity that I'd seen to him many years before. It was four years later and halfway around on the other side of the North America. And um, then Radhana Swami was there in California, San Diego. And, and, and this devotee and myself and another devotee, we went to the class and Radhana Swami was there. And Kirtan Nandamars was speaking in the class 
And then we went across the street to the little house they had for him. And he walked in and he said, Ms. Ringo, where have you been? He said, well, you told me to go preach. And right on Swami, he has this thing where he can raise one eyebrow. <laughs> I can't do that. <laughs> and he didn't say anything, but he was like, and then we went out of the house. I said, Ms. Ringo, um, I was there when you were arguing with Radha Swami and Mara said to you, um, you fool. <laughs> your authority and you didn't ask him what he thought or you didn't ask him advice he didn't and then you said he didn't say anything and then you left and you've been floating around so then he came back to new Vrindavan and in Prabhupada's palace above Prabhupada's Vyasasana there's an amazing ceiling that's made of like uh, I don't know 12,000 little pieces of individually carved and cast gypsum and it comes down like a, it goes up like a dome and it comes down like a cone and the Shringa did that and when he came back he all of a sudden, he looked like a devotee again, you know? <laughs> we have to be really careful. Who are we serving? Who are we taking shelter of? And it's based on our desire. We'll get the quality of association we ask for, Prabhupada said. If we want a first-class association, first-class authority, Krishna will send someone that we, who we will allow to speak in our life. But if we follow somebody who's third-class, we'll become fourth-class, and we'll just be <laughs> floating around in this vague, amorphous service, you know? bliss mm. <laughs> i go where i want to go I, you know and we can lose we can lose the grace of the spiritual master only by the great grace of the spiritual master can we get the grace of krishna and it comes down through the succession and through the authorities that we have right now and no uncertain terms you know each of us knows this is the representative of my spiritual master who i'm taking shelter of now and i inquire from him how can i serve you I'm talking too long. I'm sorry. Where is the problem? But a wonderful point. You made the point perfectly already. I'm just I'm, I'm elaborating. Thank you for that beautiful story. Beautiful incident. Thank you. Jai Shri Radha Mulli Darji Ki Jai.